Peter Kramer, welcome to American Enterprise Institute. Thank you. Very excited that you're here to talk about your new book, Ordinarily Well. Yes. And of course, people know you, I think, most as the author of the 1986 Listening to Prozac. 93. 93. 93. Yeah, we go back to 86, you and I, but... but this, oh, Prozac came out in, yeah, in 86. Yeah, yeah. Um, right, of course. And uh, yes, in fact, we go back even before that right. because everyone knows you're the author of Listening to Prozac, but they don't know that you were one of my favorite teachers at Brown Medical School. Right. We, we're Exciting. At, we were both together. Great to have such an accomplished student. Uh, well, thank you. I mean, you saved me from radiology. Remember, I was <laughs> I almost remember. headed in that direction. I remember. You but, thought you'd uh, be better, better with, <laughs> with people. people. Right. Okay. So, um, great. So here we are to talk about, as I said, uh, Ordinarily Well, which is about antidepressants. Right. A controversy. About Contro and there is a lot of controversy. Yeah. So before, just before I get to the controversy, just let me ask you a basic question. What are antidepressants for right. and what is depression? Right. So let's start with depression. People feel hopeless, sad. They don't experience pleasure. They have low energy. Lots of other symptoms, sleep, appetite, maybe suicidal, and at a level that really interferes with their lives. And those are sort of the modern definition, but we know depression when we see it. Depression used to be diagnosed years ago by doctors just feeling that these patients were really sad in a way that the person sitting across from them experienced as very burdensome. And it turns out that that condition, which has been recognized by humans as a disorder forever, right, going back to Hippocrates and melancholy forever, is a multi-system disease. If you have it long enough, it interferes with the way you make bone, the way you make blood elements. It interferes with your hormonal glands. It is a, a true bodily multi-system disease, you know, seen at that level, and it's a disorder of the mind, you know, as we experience it between people. Right, so the brain and the mind, if right. you were, even though everyone knows they're effectively the same thing, yeah. but different levels of analysis right. and different language and different, different ways of entering right. those frameworks. So say a little bit about the history of antidepressants and, and what are the antidepressants, yeah. at least that are most people use today? So for all of medical history, going back to Hippocrates, doctors have wanted to have some substance that would combat melancholy, you know, this terrible, leaden, flat, you know, death of the soul where people just can't get moving, can't engage in life, think about killing themselves. And in 1957, uh, using a couple of different substances, different doctors got the idea that they actually had something to hand that did this, right? There was this doctor I write about at length in the book, uh, Roland Kuhn in Switzerland, who had a medicine that was supposed to treat psychosis, gave it to patients, wasn't very good, but uh, some of the patients got less depressed and he got permission to give it to uh, depressed inpatients, outpatients, more and less seriously ill people, and he realized he had an antidepressant. And pretty soon there was some sense of what this medicine was doing in the brain and how that might, re might relate to mood disorders. So, you know, 1957 is sort of the conventional date. What was that called? That medicine was imipramine. Trade name was Tofranil. There were others. Um, and so those were in use. In, and they're still in use now, but, I mean, they were uh, widely in use up through the 1980s. And we started getting this new group of antidepressants that had more effect on a chemical use for transmission in the brain called uh, serotonin that has more effect on the transmission that uses that medicine. And they were medicines like uh, Prozac and Zoloft, later uh, Celexa, which was earlier in Europe, and uh, Lexapro. So a lot of the medicines you might have heard of as antidepressants started coming into use uh, in the late 80s, 1990s. And they're the ones that are mostly given now. You know, I worked in a, a clinic. Um, I mean, I work in a methadone clinic all the time, but I did some extra work last year in a more general psychiatric setting. And I was referred so many people with, who are given the label of depression. Right. And yet, they actually, they didn't strike me as that depressed. Right. They struck me as demoralized. Yeah, no, I think your gut, the experienced doctor's gut, is really a good way of understanding depression. And I think we have lots of trouble studying it because no one wants to say, well, 
doctor, what's your gut call on this patient and study that patient? Everyone wants these catalogs of symptoms. But yes, I think the quality of stuckness, the sense that the person's perspective really is distorted, that something goes well, they can't see it as going well, it only reinforces the hopelessness. So it's both stuckness in terms of the fixed negative perspective that's very hard to emerge from, even in the course of you know, a conversation, and then the longitudinal stuckness that just, it just remains day after day and good things happen and it stays, stays there despite. So the lack of reactivity is, yes. more, is more diagnostic, as it were, of depression. Right. Whereas so many of my patients were, as I said, I think more demoralized. Their life circumstances were so chaotic. A lot of these people right. were inner city folks. And, um, yeah, I mean, there, there's which a whole mean they can't get complicated those folks discussion can't get we could have yeah. because, you know, there's this dispute in the field about grief. And, you know, if there's a good reason for you to be depressed mm -hmm. and you have all the symptoms of depression, and they last and last, is that depression or is it not? And I would say, and I think the field more and more is saying it is. If you do these complicated, you know, genetic studies, the studies come out better if you count that as depression. So just the mere fact of having a cause, I think, doesn't get you out of the category. But yes, people who sort of slip in and out and they have good days and bad days, we don't want to call that depression. Yeah. Well, you know, you just hit on a major theme of your book, which is that gut instinct, the clinical experience, right. the clinical encounter versus the randomized control clinical trial. Right. So, and, yeah. So we have these very objective ways of looking at depression, ways of measuring it, ways of doing studies where you compare treatments to non-treatments or proxies for treatment and then uh, inert proxies. And then we have sort of what doctors see every day. And the question is, you know, what counts as evidence? And of course, nowadays, and maybe forever, we, we value the more objective stuff more. But there's sort of a benign dialectic between the two, right? If the research shows something, doctors try it. If doctors try it and it's working, there's more research. So that really we have kind of a complicated form of information what I like to think about is if you are meeting with a doctor and you're depressed or your relative whom you love is depressed, you want that to change, what do you want to inform that encounter? And to some extent, it's objective research. To some extent, you probably want some experience. So I think we could have a co more complicated notion of, of what counts as evidence. Mm -hmm. And um, But the essence of a randomized clinical trial, just to go back to that, is yeah. something that it's hard, to, it's hard to assess in the clinical encounter and, and goes to the virtue of these trials, which right. is placebo. Right. And the placebo issue is one with lots of resonance for your book. Let's just start with the fact that I think it inspired your book. Right. I, there was all this talk about these medicines just being placebos with side effects, which means like dummy pills that make you feel like you're on a drug and you're not getting better because of the inherent efficacy of the drug because of the way the drug interacts with your brain and alters it and allows you to behave differently. The whole complicated series of things that may inform recovery. No, the claim was any pill, a sugar pill, would do the same thing if you believed uh, it was an antidepressant. And that claim, I think, started causing doctors, even though these medicines are widely prescribed, in critical situations not to turn to the medicines when I would say they should. I think that is a canard. I don't think depression is very placebo responsive. I mean, I think we want to distinguish two things. To know that the medicines work, what we'd like to do is set up a situation where we see how people do on the medicine and we see what's called the hypothetical counterfactual. What would have happened if they had the same uh, weather, the same spouse, uh, the same contact with doctors? but didn't get the active ingredient in the drug. So how would they do without treatment? How do they do with treatment? And that gets confused with this much more particular idea, which is people get better because they have, because they have faith in a pill. You know, that seems to me a much narrower belief, and there's a lot less evidence for that. But some people do get better, su surprisingly better, uh, with uh, social stimulation right. and connection. Right. I remember seeing a, a, a patient uh, who I thought for sure would need shock therapy. I mean, that's how 
almost immobilized this woman was. She lived with her mother. It was almost like a now Voyager situation <laughs> where she li lived with her mother yeah. well into her adult life and the mother died. And on the one hand, of course, she found it liberating, but there was an enormous burden that came with it. Right. And um, I was, that was the first visit. And then she, of course, was coming back. And I thought, oh, for sure, you know, we'd need hospitalization. Yes. She was living with a sister otherwise thought maybe we need it that day but but i was shocked at at the right. at, at how she could rally a bit right. now I, I hate to admit um she dropped out so uh, she may that. well have re have Long relapsed review. into that yeah but yeah, uh, but, but maybe not right we can i true. mean i think we see this the reason we as psychiatrists like to sit with people a while is that if you can you know it's not urgent you don't have to worry about suicide immediately or loss of a job or divorce, whatever it is, you have a t little time to sit. Sometimes you find listening, supporting, teasing things apart, uh, passage of time, people get remarkably better, right? People got better from depression sometimes uh, before anyone invented. Yeah, and that doesn't mean it's any less real. No, yeah. no, and Although that's why I you, think people can think it's any less why real. Why you want to do these trials, right? Because when you, ha you have people come in, you take their blood pressure, you talk to them, you ask them about their depression, do a long inventory, spend a lot of time with them week after week in the course of a drug trial. Maybe it's all that human contact that's helping. Maybe, you know, I take people in the book to a, a drug trial center and I go out in the van, you know, the van picks people up where they live and brings them to the center. And just the conversation in the van is very supportive. So that lots of things go on in a drug trial. And we don't want to say attribute that kind of benefit, if it's beneficial, uh, to the drug. We want to know what is the drug doing beyond all that human contact. So when you see a patient, uh, unless you think someone is suicidal and you have to act in an in a, uh, emergent way, um, could you have kind of a, uh, an intuitive algorithm? I mean, I don't think you whip out your prescription pad on the first visit, or maybe yeah. you do sometimes. I but mean, what would... I, I, I do. I, I think that to some extent I'm the instrument, and I ask myself, how worried am I? If I, as the conversation progresses, get more and more alarmed, you know, I take that to uh, be a reason for caution or possibly action. Uh, whereas if things look bad at first, and as we talk, I get a sense of some reasons why things are happening and some flickers of responsiveness, some human connection, then I think, well, we can, you know, afford to be a little patient. Maybe we're going to, you know, do some good along the way. Uh, and, and not to say that I may not reach for the prescription pad at a certain moment. To me, you know, we know that this is a disorder that is destructive in itself, that people start losing memory. There are extraordinary, extraordinary studies you don't want to know the answer to where people stay depressed for a long time and the risk of the next episode is greater. The downstream episodes tend to be more complicated, need more treatment. You'd like to interrupt an episode of depression. And I think to me, the measure of the utility of a treatment is that it works. I know that sounds, uh, but it sounds, uh, 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 you know, uh, sort of circular, but um, it's remarkable how often people don't appreciate that. They say, I believe in yoga and meditation. Well, that's fine, but is your depression retreating or is it progressing? If it's progressing, maybe it's time for one of these much better tested remedies like psychotherapy or medication or both. Yeah, it, right. And the idea is, well, I thought you challenged this a little in your book. Um, uh, that the the idea was that they actually had a synergistic effect. Yeah, and you seemed it's, a little skeptical of that. Well, you know, I think the main thing I'm doing in the book. First of all, I want to say this is a complicated book. I hope in a good way. It has a lot it's of very history. Read it's incredibly readable. That's what I want to hear. I yeah. work, you know, so hard at getting it readable, and there's some. Uh, technical things in it, but I do a lot of storytelling both from the history of psychiatry and from my practice and sort of the intersection my time spent with some of the pioneers in the field who were developing under understanding of depression and depression treatment. And um, so I try to put everything in a very human, humane, I hope, context. Um, and also, but, but also to look at some of the fallacies. It seems to me 
that there are a lot of attacks on antidepressants, some of them very legitimate based on things drug companies have done that cross ethical lines, uh, but attacks that really come, I think, from a misguided sense that attacking antidepressants defends psychotherapy or def defends humane approaches to illness, mm -hmm. uh, which I think is not the case. And so that a lot of the book is saying what constitutes, if we're going to talk about objective evidence, what's objective, what's good evidence, and the truth is, if you like the evidence for exercise and diet and whatever, you're going to love the evidence for psychotherapy. It's much stronger. I'm, I'm, for, I'm sorry, I was going to say for pharmacology, true for psychotherapy also. And that particular question of the intersection, does it help to combine medication and psychotherapy? I think it does. It's what I do. If I'm medicating patients, I'm seeing them often. I'm trying to puzzle out what's going on in their lives with them. Um, but it turns out to be actually very hard to show that the combination is a lot better than medication alone, partly because medication does pretty well. Actually, that brings me to my next question, which is, can, can you actually put a number um, on the eff effectiveness? Yeah, it turns out to be very hard. Let me tell you the main problem with putting a number on. These drugs work. And when you have a drug that works, and they're generic, and you can get them on Medicaid, and you can get them in uh, you know, HMOs, and so on, uh, a doctor who is ethical uh, facing a patient with serious depression where the moment arises to, arises to prescribe will prescribe a medicine, not send the person to a drug trial where he or she might get placebo. So it's very hard to get a good collection of patients. Um, you know, there's some astonishingly good effects. There was an open trial in Sweden in primary care clinics, and it was sort of a select group of people. They weren't suicidal, they weren't alcoholic, they just had, you know, probably fairly easy to treat depression. And at the end of six months, over 90% of people on a routine antidepressant, it was uh, Celexa, Citalopram, uh, had at least half of their symptoms remit. So they were, you know, somewhat better. Uh, so, you know, probably numbers in the 60 per 70 percent range for uh, the first thing offered are, are more reasonable. There's a funny number, 30 percent, that we read a lot. And uh, that 30 percent came from a study of patients who had been depressed 15 years. They were in a seventh or eighth episode of depression. They were two years into an episode of depression. They hadn't responded to other treatments. Most of them were also alcoholic or had another mental illness. And 30% of them in the first medicine given ended the episode of depression, which was considered not a good outcome, but I think it's a pretty it's good outcome. It's a pretty refractory group. In that tough group, there are other studies. There's another wonderful study where doctors were allowed to do their worst, just you know, change the medicine, add medicines, just do whatever you need. And you could take a group that looks like that, and most of them would leave an episode of depression and stay well for six months. So... And the excitement, the initial excitement, um, about, and the continued popularity of these serato selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, which is the right. class that Prozac is, belongs to, and other in inhibitors um, like Celexa and Zoloft, and, right. uh, was that their side effect profile right. and their dangerousness if in overdose was a lot less. Right. So when these medicines became available, and in Europe and here, you know, in the late 1980s, um, it wasn't thought that they were going to be such terrific antidepressants, but it was, was thought they would be better tolerated and maybe better for parts of depression that the traditional drugs had missed a bit, like social anxiety, social isolation, and so on. And those little factors, being better tolerated, not making you feel like you were on a medicine, uh, not giving you dry mouth and constipation, and allowing you maybe a little more uh, social comfort. Those turned out to be much more important than doctors had imagined. Patients really uh, like these medicines better and you could leave them on them longer, which leads to a whole complicated discussion of how long, but um, people just didn't want to get off them right away. And, and you think, um, and I, in your book, you clearly tried to get to the bottom of this because there are really no good data available, but that severe major depression, what used to be called melancholia in the old DSM, right. but it's not designated that anymore, now would be called severe depression, right. uh, which is marked by immobilization, sometimes right. even psych psychotic um, idea ideas about 
rotting, feeling dead inside, being yeah. dead. Um, uh, uh, gosh, almost a pseudo kind of dementia profile. Yeah, that profile. terrible thing you see in yeah. Durer etchings, you know, the person who's rubbing his hands and looking at the ground and swaying and very thin almost to the point of dying, you know, yeah. that, 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 that depression. Maybe we don't, that species may, at least in this country, yeah. may have started to fade because we've gotten in sooner with these medications. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to live or die as a thinker based on that observation, but I think we see less of it than we did even earlier in my career, which goes back, I hate to say it, 40 years, but yes. Yeah, which is different from some of the cultural um, distinctions, like we may not see hysteria anymore right. or recognize it as such. Yeah, I mean, we don't know why we see less, right? Yeah. It might be that there have been some cultural changes. And we certainly don't have less suicides, so it's not like we've done this perfect job with uh, mood disorders. I mean, I think suicide did go down probably after these medicines came in, and it's come up a bit for complicated reasons. But yeah. I do think that particular very disturbing form of depression that you really would hate to see, anyone would hate to see it. Uh, I think we see less of it, and I think likely it's because we interrupt depression in its course with these medicines. Do you think, I've, some, some say, I'm echoing a political candidate here, mm -hmm. some that say, right. um, uh, antidepressants are overprescribed. Right. Uh, Folks it, say that. <laughs> <laughs> what do you say? You know, it's a complicated story. <laughs> I have what I think is a fun chapter in the book where I look at different ways of looking at the same study where one group looks at it and says, you know, we don't have the specific diagnoses we need. Doctors are prescribing people who don't really have this core problem, depression. Another group says, yeah, but these people have been hospitalized for depression before. They, you know, had uh, uh, terrible events in their lives. They've uh, have other uh, illnesses alongside, and that this is, you know, on the whole, the drug, the group being pres prescribed for is a pretty acute uh, and chronic group. It's a group with a lot wrong with them. So I, I, I think it's hard to know. Uh, I think probably both things are happening, that people who don't need the medicine are on them, and certainly it's the case that many people who could benefit from the medicine have never uh, been on any antidepressants. So I think we we need to get a little more precise in uh, prescribing and educating doctors about how to prescribe. Yeah, and the key word there is doctors because most of these medications are actually prescribed. Right. I mean, psychiatrists are doctors, of course, right. but they're prescribed by primary care doctors right. who don't have the kind of follow-up that right. you have. And right. However, I do think there, and I'm, you know, maybe out on a limb or not, you know, in the mainstream in this, that the main problem with primary care prescribing is that people go off the medicine. Mm -hmm. uh, they aren't followed up well, they aren't encouraged, they don't know how to translate some little progress into greater progress. They go off the medicine, uh, you know, and uh, the other uh, problem that doctors are simply overprescribing, I think is counterbalanced by the enormous tendency to underprescribe before these medicines became popular. Uh, so a lot of depression was missed diagnostically, and most of what was diagnosed wasn't treated, and what was treated wasn't treated thoroughly. So I think probably on the better or worse side, we do a little better than prior generations mm -hmm. did. And that's certainly not uh, unique to depression. It's the story of right. ADHD and, and illness, yeah. uh, other things as well. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you work, how, when a patient comes to you and uh, they've sort of suffered what we'd call an acute insult, right. like they just got a divorce or they lost their job or yes. there's a death in the family. Right. And uh, clearly they're presenting with sadness, they're crying, they've lost interest, maybe yes. they're not eating as much. Right. Assuming again, it's not an acute situation where you right. feel they're a danger to themselves. Yeah. Um, how long might you wait? Right. I mean, I know there's not a, oh my gosh, right. it's been three weeks, time no, to I'm start the Prozac. Looking but looking my watch of the yeah. calendar. First of all, with these cataclysmic events, most people have fairly varied psychological responses, right? So they may be a little depressed, a little anxious, a little angry, irritable, uh, a little isolative. Uh, so there are lots of things going on, and most of the responses don't have this syndromal form of looking just simply like an episode of depression. So one thing that catches my attention is if this just looks like depression, I'm interested if there's a family history of depression, if there are past episodes of depression, if there's suicides around. 
you know, in the family history say, I, you know, that has my attention And if they're more. drinking or using drugs. If they're drinking or using drugs, I'm not happy. That yeah. doesn't necessarily make me rush to use antidepressants, but and it gets your yes, attention. it gets my attention. So, and then I think if the depression, speaking about now about this sort of syndromal thing, right, the lack of ability to experience pleasure, a loss of interest in ordinary activities, difficulties at work are a good marker. You know, we like people to be able to get up in the morning still and go to work and be seen by their uh, co-workers as doing an ordinary job. Um, yeah, if things start going wrong in that way and staying wrong, uh, I start thinking this is not just, you know, uh, normal response to bad news. This is starting to worry me. And as I say, worry is kind of my deep mm -hmm. marker for uh, th having a discussion about medication. Um, so what's been the um, <clears throat> reception to the book, if you were to make a distinction, or maybe there isn't a distinction, between how your colleagues reacted to it and mm -hmm. how the... The, the, the reviews in the popular in right. popular venues react. I was very worried about responses to this book. I just kept saying to uh, people I knew, I'm I'm just going to be attacked mercilessly because there's such I think a leaning in the press to uh, reporting things that are negative about drugs, underreporting things that are confirmatory about their their working, and that I didn't happen. I I think I got. Lots of thoughtful reviews. Some were, you know, had some skepticism, but I also got these really rewarding reviews. The Sunday New York Times, Scott Stossel, uh, the Book Review, uh, The Atlantic, Jonathan Rosen. These are just the kind of reviews that look at my career as a whole, say where this book fits in, and I think give me the sort of benefit of the doubt that this is a humane, thoughtful, caring person, not to pat myself on the back, I'm just saying what I hope, always hoped would come through in the book anyway, someone who wants to get it right, probably getting it right. You have a literary background. Yes. And uh, you went, you had postgraduate work in, in English literature? literature? Yeah. At, at, at University College, College London, London. Right. And you've written a, um, no, a novel. By Scribner, yeah. No, my baby, what I recommend <laughs> to people, yes. And um, uh, so you've got a, um, I, I guess I'd call it a, a kind of, I always think, the, frankly, the novelists are where you learn the most about. Yeah, <laughs> I do too. It's like about, the, about the people's inner I, life. I did one of these roundup reviews and it got people me, angry at me uh, back when the, f you know, the first slew of uh, sort of psycho autopathography, the, the memoirs of depression were coming out and the New York Times Book Review had me write about six. And I said, you know, it's probably good in terms of stigma that people are writing this, but here are these novels that have come out and collections of short stories lately that I think really capture depression. So, uh, you know, Tom Gunn, I forget what the list was, but um, yeah, I'm a great respecter of literature. Do you think it, um, I can't help but think that it influenced you as a therapist. Absolutely. You... I, honestly, I'm thinking about literature all the time. Robert Coles was one of my mentors. He's written about, you know, teaching short stories, thinking about short stories. And often I'll be sitting with a patient and I'll think about, you know, some little snippet out of Tolstoy or something. And I'll think, oh, we're, you know, that's where we are. I mean, it's just my way of thinking. And I'm sure someone who's a you know, pianist and uh, psychiatrist, as some of our colleagues are, or uh, a student of history, you know, that there are many things to bring to bear in psychotherapy. Um, but I do think about literature and I think about narrative. As I listen, I think, oh, that's a false note. Maybe we better go over that one again. Um, and I don't, I don't know that I'd be doing psychotherapy at all if I hadn't been immersed in literature. Yeah. And what do you, when you, you still see medical students, right? Do you still supervise yeah, them? Less and less. less yeah, I hate to say. But I, you still, ha I'm sure, have your yes. finger on right. at least a weak pulse of yeah. the kind of psych teaching and psychiatry right. that goes on now in yeah. residency and, and medical schools. Are you somewhat uh, pessimistic? Because I worry I a little do, bit. I do worry. I, uh, for 15 years, I, at, uh, I taught a uh, basic psychotherapy course, and at the end of 15 years, and this is maybe 15 years ago, 
the head of the program said, you know, this is too difficult for incoming students. And uh, that's really a fourth year course instead of a second year course. Mm -hmm. And I uh, ended up actually never teaching it again. And I think it, it partly is that there's just less time for psychotherapy in the residencies. Partly it's that that whole framework of seeing things is different so that it used to be when there was a dispute with the nurses and social workers, someone would sit everybody down and say, what are the you know, underlying a conflicts? Yeah, out of process. <laughs> I, I don't that. know that that goes on. So psychotherapy has been a little marginalized in psychiatry, although I have to say I'm very encouraged that young people coming out of training and I am impressed with them. I refer to them. I think they're you know, here from patients, they're doing a good job. That's so reassuring. It is what some smart people like a lot. So what should the, you wrote the book to dispel some myths and, yeah. and, uh, and clear the air on um, the right. issue of antidepressants that's really been, uh, I'd say, under, I, attack might not be too strong a word in yeah. the last few, no, few years. So, uh, so what, would, what is the, what would be the takeaway from well, you know, I Ordinarily Well? I chose the title Ordinarily Well because I wanted to say these medicines work ordinarily well. They're not, you know, they're all kinds of side effects, right? There are worries that antidepressants early in the early going may make people more suicidal. Same is true for some drugs for epilepsy. They may make people more suicidal, you know, in the early going. These are medicines doctors know how to use. They're kind of in the range of effectiveness that tracks other treatments doctors use for all kinds of other conditions. Um, and they don't do something eerie. They take people who are depressed and make them, this is another use of the phrase ordinarily well, right? They bring them back to where they were, where they wish they had been. Um, you know, that said, there are a lot of other questions that aren't efficacy questions strictly. They're, you know, how long do you leave people on? Are there alternative treatments? Uh, are there side effects? Um, so, you know, as with any medicine, you'd like to have them in expert hands. Um, but the one thing I think we don't have to worry about is in the first instance, are they uh, working through the way they're supposed to work. Yes, they are. Uh, they're not dummy pills. They're active chemicals that, you know, make it easier for the brain to make more cells and make more connections between cells. They allow learning to resume. They unstick people a little from the two kinds of stuckness we discussed before. And, and also, this book is an inter interesting reverberations right. of uh, listening to Prozac because in, in that book, uh, you coined the term cosmetic psychopharmacology, in other words, making oneself more attractive than before right. or better than well, which right. would be a, uh, an improvement from baseline. Yeah. And uh, in, in this book, we're talking about returning to well. baseline. Right. I think listening to Prozac was a worrying book. It said, we have medicines that maybe have effects on personality. Our doctor is going to be tempted to use them in over-enthusiastic ways. And better than well was, you know, people who had some episode, say, of depression, got better, thought they did a better job at work or parenting, got over the episode and would come back into their doctor and say, you know, I was better than well on that medicine. Could you, could you give it to me again? And so I think having raised those worries about complicated uses of medicine, I wanted to say that the most straightforward, simple uses for the treatment of depression are perfectly legitimate, in fact, necessary, and that these are not, as I say, eerie substances. They make, they make people ordinarily well. So yes, it was in a way, the reason I in particular felt I should enter that discussion and make the correction against these debunking placebo-centered studies was uh, claims, uh, was that I had sort of raised some worries in a, in a prior book. Well, there's nothing ordinary about having you as one of my first mentors, and wonderful to see you today. Good, and thank you so you. much. Thank you.